As we enter into the season of Advent, in which we recall the coming of the Lord in history, we prepare for his coming in majesty, and even in the daily comings in mystery. Many of you will perhaps have sung some of the hymns from one of the greatest oratorios, a religious work by George Frederick Handel called The Messiah. And in it, it captures all of this, the history, the mystery, and the majesty of the coming of the Lord. Well, what many people don't know is that that was not an easy work for Handel to come up with. In fact, Handel, who was born a Lutheran in Germany and eventually made his way to England in the 18th century, uh, was composing various kinds of operas and chamber music and so forth, which initially was popular and then it sort of went out of favor. In fact, things had gotten so bad for him, he didn't even know how he was going to pay his debts. He was afraid he'd be put in a debtor's prison. And he had then had a cerebral hemorrhage, which paralyzed one side of his body. Things were rather dark in the life of Handel. And just as he was contemplating this tragic experience and wondering what he would do with his life, A friend of his, Charles Jennings, who was not a well-known poet, but an amateur poet, had composed a libretto for an oratorio. It's the one we know as the Messiah. In other words, all of the scriptures. He had taken the scriptures from the Bible and put them together as an oratorio. And he needed someone to set it to music, so he came to his friend Handel. Now Handel, who was very discouraged, very depressed, took the libretto, read through it, prayed over it, and within less than a month, I believe it was 28 days, he composed all of that extraordinary music. In fact, someone walked in on his room. He didn't leave the house for like three weeks, just composing and composing and composing. And someone walked into his room, and Handel was in tears. And he looked at the man and he said, I don't know whether I was in my body or outside of it, but I just concluded the Hallelujah Chorus. And he was in tears. We preach the message of Christ, we read it in the Bible, and yet when it's set to music in this great work, it moves souls. People who are not even Christians will listen to this work and their souls have been moved. For a man who almost gave up because of the darkness in his life, the discouragement, he then at that lowest point, this lowest ebb, composed his greatest work and perhaps the most magnificent religious spiritual composition in the history of the world. And it's been played 250 times. When it was performed, 1742, for the first time after he completed at the end of 1741. When it was first performed, do you know what he did? He did it as a fundraiser for those in debtor's prison. He knew he might have been the next one there. 142 men were released from prison after his first performance because of the money that he raised. And then the King of England came to the concert and he was so moved that during the hallelujah chorus, the king stood up and then everybody else stood up. And so that's the tradition ever since then, during the hallelujah chorus, everybody stands for this great and magnificent conclusion. How many times we find ourselves in a period of darkness and think there is no hope. And then the Lord of hope comes to our souls if we but pray, if we but turn to the Almighty. We've just celebrated our national holiday of Thanksgiving. And the very first time it was declared a national holiday was by George Washington in 1789. Now, 
the Revolutionary War was over, Constitution's coming to life, the nation is beginning to stabilize, and he said, we'll have a day to give thanks to Almighty God. But strangely enough, after Washington gave us that first national holiday, it didn't happen for another 70 years. And you know when it happened? Abraham Lincoln, in 1863, in the midst of the Civil War, said, we as a nation have forgotten God, and we must give thanks to Almighty God. Right there in the middle of the war, this is what President Lincoln wrote. The country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. Now here they are, there's a war going on. And yet he had this vision, he continues. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that we should solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledge this one heart and one voice by the whole American people, a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in this lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. And it was sealed by Abraham Lincoln, the president, in 1863, the middle of the Civil War. And so, yes, even in the darkest of circumstances, St. Paul says, give thanks to God in every circumstance. You see, there is something greater than optimism. As a nation, we have generally been an optimistic nation. And think about children as they approach Christmas. They're quite optimistic about what they're going to get from Santa, aren't they? I was just with my two and a half year old grandniece in Louisiana, and she was full of opti optimism seemingly every hour of the day until you told her no. <laughs> optimism. But blind optimism is not a Christian virtue. As you know, as we grow older and we mature and we recognize the many, many challenges we face in this world, we do not give up on hope because hope is a gift of God. It's the birth of Christian hope, really, that we celebrate in the season of Advent because God has come to us. God will return to us. And God is coming even now in the mysteries of our faith. Frederick Douglass, who was fighting for the end of slavery, the abolition of, of slavery in America, had come to a point where it seemed the Congress, the Supreme Court, everybody was abandoning this cause. And so he addressed a group of, of his followers in a very dark mood. Well, many of you remember the famous African-American woman who was sitting, by the way, in the front seat at this gathering. Her name was Sojourner Truth. And every eye was on her with this heavy, heavy, dark spirit in the gathering. And she stood up and with her long finger pointed it at Frederick Douglass and said, Frederick, is God dead? And you know at that moment, the spirit in the room shifted. Of course not. God is not dead. Lenin is dead. God isn't dead. Right? All of these people who had declared God dead, they're all dead. 
But God is not dead. God is alive. God is real. And God is working if we say yes to the divine will. We tend to focus on the problems instead of focusing on the protecting God, our God who says, I call you my friend. And this God, the Lord God, is the one who can free us from the slavery to sin. As we give thanks and prepare our hearts to receive God today, I want you to hear these words from the third pope after St. Peter. His name was Clement, St. Clement of Rome. Cause for our gratitude. He said this, Beloved, how blessed and wonderful are God's gifts. Life everlasting, joy in righteousness, goodness, truth and freedom, faith, confidence, self-control and holiness, and these are the gifts that we can comprehend. What of all the others that are being prepared for those who look to God? Only the Creator, the Father of the ages, the All-Holy, knows their grandeur and loveliness. And so we should strive to be found among those who wait for Him so that we may share in these promised gifts. And how is it to be? It will come about if by our faith our minds remain fixed on God. If we aim at what is pleasing and acceptable to him, if we accomplish what is in harmony with his faultless will and follow the path of truth, rejecting all injustice, viciousness, covetousness, quarrels, malice, and deceit, this is the path, beloved, by which we find our salvation. Jesus Christ, the high priest of our sacrifices, the defender and ally in our helplessness. It is through him that we can gaze upon the highest heavens. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Come into our hearts, which we now prepare for you. For as the great George Friedrich Handel wrote in the conclusion of his work, he shall reign forever and ever. Amen.